Heavenly Father, thank you so much. What a beautiful day. You just continue to awe us with, one, with your love, and two, with your, your spirit, with your bounty. Father, we just thank you so much for this ability to come to you freely and openly, worshiping, praising you, and learning from you. Thank you for allowing me to be your servant this morning. May this be about you. May it be your words, not mine. In Jesus' name, the people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Let's get started. Happy Labor Day weekend. And we get to rest. Uh huh. No. Has, has anybody else noticed this? That you seem to work harder on Labor Day weekend than you do during the rest of the year even? It's like, how many moms here went through the nesting urge? I remember that during Lamaze class. Now, Mr. Hall, she's going to go through a nesting urge. I'm like, huh? <laughs> what? There's that period just before she's going to have birth where she starts frantically preparing the nest. That's to me this Labor Day weekend. I'm looking, okay, winter's coming. I've got things to do, you know? Even Home Depot and Lowe's is on, on it. They start putting out their ad. You better get weather stripping. You better get this. Winter's coming. I, others are like, no! I'm like, yes, fall! I love it! Do I, do I like the dark days of winter? Yeah. <laughs> Some are like, yeah. <laughs> Some are like, I get to stay in and read, and maybe the power go out, and it's awesome! That's the best! I do like that. <laughs> I do like that part. <laughs> but between the harvest and mowing and woodcutting I just don't seem to get any rest like when I get done with this I've got this weird thing in my head I gotta to go to town for something Amanda's like you never want to go to town I think it's the nesting urge <laughs> I haven't told her that yet <laughs> but I think y'all can relate with this that this weekend the last official weekend of summer although summer doesn't end for quite some time it just feels like it here it is Gear up, we're gonna we gotta get ready. And with that, you know I wasn't gonna just leave that note alone. Are we gearing up for something else? Are we gearing up for something else? And what I mean resting not is it really I'm not talking about resting from your preparing your house for winter. Let's get going. This scripture came from John 4:31. It says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. What is he talking about? What? This should be written in red. These are the words of Jesus talking to his disciples. It, do we have it easy? Is the work done? No, it's not. It's not. Let's, in fact, let, let's read the entire scripture. So to set this up, I'm sorry. If somebody would like me to keep my mask on, raise your hand, I'll put it back on, but I can't do it this way. There it is. So to set the scripture up in, in John, Jesus and the disciples were traveling through Samaria, which is like, <gasps> really? That's terrible. To a Jew, they, it's like... Somebody from, like I've used the, the analogy before, somebody from Mount Vernon purposely going to concrete. They just can't fathom it, right? <laughs> it's that way with the Samaritans. The Jews, you know, they've been uh, inbred. They've been all these things. They're just, ugh, ew, right? Jesus says, we're not going out across the Jordan and up and back in. We're going this direct route. And then when he gets part way, they, they come to a well and Jesus tells them, go go into town, get supplies, and while he's at this well, he starts talking to a woman, a Samaritan woman, oh who's, according to the scriptures, as you read the whole thing, had too many husbands, right? Well, Jesus talks to her. And, and I, I love the, 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 some of the ancillary messages to this, that who am I to determine who I should and shouldn't talk to? I know. I'll go with my example, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But, so anyway, he just got done talking to her. 
And in verse 31, it says, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Hmm. Was he talk, possibly talking about being sustained by something other than food? And if you're like me, that's, that's a hard concept to get through, right? That some people live to eat, other people eat to live. I'm, I'm the first. Just saying. But I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then he goes on, verse 33 says, Then the disciples said to each other, because remember, they didn't have the, the, the spirit yet, they were really thick headed commonplace guys. Could someone have brought him food? He doesn't, he doesn't want to eat. Somebody must have fed him. Verse 34 says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest, which tells me this is in spring because it's the harvest is far out. And if he was to talk about the harvest to these folks, they'd be going, that doesn't happen until August, September. What, what are you talking about, right? Don't you have four months till harvest? I tell you, open your eyes. Look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and, a, and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. And I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. So who's he talking about here? Who's, who has done the work for us to reap the benefits? Well, on a much smaller scale, I could point to Virginia. She's been in this congregation for, I'll just say a while, how's that? A while, <laughs> right? Lois, who, part, who left us in, in, in December, was here for a long time. I can remember the, the faces, the people that were here when I first walked through the door. What about the generation before that? I've got a picture in my office of 1925 when they opened the congregation it was in the little white community church down the road on Talcott at the corner of Talcott the picture of the building and the original congregation standing in front of it I know there were no Ku Klux Klan people there at the time not when this picture was taken that's a different story okay. but what about the labor that they put in are we reaping what they have sown. Yeah, of course we have. We, we're reaping the, 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 the benefits of the work that someone last week has done. But let's look at the bigger picture. What about the Old Testament? Do you consider that Abraham, I know you're not a, a son or daughter of Abraham that I know of, but what about the work that he put in? What about the faithfulness of, of, of him? What about the faithfulness of Moses? What about Noah? What about all the disciples? Oh, and we can't go without mentioning our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What about the labor, that the hard work that they did, and we get to reap the benefits? Ah. <sighs> The thousands and thousands of years of prophecies, prophecies coming true, the, the stories that, you know, like, you know, I'm going to write the book about the underdogs of the Bible, the ones that, what happened to Judas, really? I want to, I want, he put in the work, somebody had to do it. And I, I have pity, I, I feel for the man. I feel for the man that was dragged out of the crowd to help carry Jesus' cross. He didn't get up this morning and go, eh, I think I'll go help somebody get crucified. But the most uncommon person doing the greatest things for, for Jesus, amen? That's who we need to be talking about. We need to be talking about not, of course, we want to talk about 
the big guys, you know, the Moses, the Abrams, all those guys, the Joshua's, who was one of my favorites. But let's talk about the worker. The worker. Let's talk about the deacon and deaconesses. You know, the elders are to be the spiritual minds, the ones that are the teaching and, and preaching, and the deacons are to be waiting the tables. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about those that are doing, and we use this term, the expected. Hmm? The expected? Yeah. Well, you expect somebody's going to clean the toilets, right? You're going to, you expect somebody's going to do the dishes, which, by the way, don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> I've been amassing, because I come in on, you know, during the week a lot, and I water glasses up, and there quite a few in the sink. I'll do them. I don't expect that. But we expect somebody to vacuum the floor. Right? We expect somebody is going to be talking to the lost. Who are the workers? Mm. Even this body, so many put in the work. Every day. Every day. But the work is not done. Amen? Amen? In Matthew 9, 35, that's where I didn't want to go to Wednesday night, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless. Folks, I'm going to stop right there. There it comes, there's going to be coming a day, and I'm not prophesying, or I'm not, you know, I don't believe <laughs> Am I? <laughs> but I just look around. If our churches, the small, the large, if the saints of today are not prepared for the helpless and harassed of tomorrow, we have not done our job. Amen? We are not prepared. To, to receive the helpless and the harassed. There may be a day that we are harassed, but we are not helpless ever. Amen? Amen? We have Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We've got a God that I've talked about the last few weeks that designs our plans, that guides our footsteps, that if we ask, we'll move the mountain. We shouldn't be sitting back and going, I just... We only have 20 people here today. All it takes is one great heart. We have the Holy Spirit. When He is ready to move, He will move. And when it happens, are we ready? Are we prepared? Are we prepared? Kind of like that nesting urge. I feel kind of like look, reading the news and stuff. As a pastor, I start having that nesting urge. Is the church ready? For when... Those type of things that are happening in the world come to little old Cedra Woolley, and it will. How do I know that? I read history. Every great civilization has gotten so large and so top heavy and so corrupt and so everything that it falls upon itself. And the Christians of history have been there and suffered through it. And guess what? We're still here. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? What about all those other ancient civilizations and their religions? Where are they now? Where are they? Hmm. Well, you find them on the internet. But they're not here. And they were designed to serve the people. They were designed to serve the God. Our God has designed us and Himself to serve us. To serve us. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Why don't we read that, continue with that scripture? When He saw the crowds, He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We have a shepherd. Amen. We have the great shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 
Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into His harvest field. Who are the workers? And what is our job? Our job is to show them who the great shepherd is. Where to find their comfort. Where to find their care. And it's not in a loaf of bread. It may be to start with. It may be. It may be in a case of water to start with. But where it goes from there is to get them to understand that this life is limited. This life is a vapor compared to eternity. And to show them who the shepherd is and what he can do for them into eternity. Give them the out. The out. You know, everybody's looking for an out. Everybody's looking for a way to escape whatever they're in. The world's finding it in the wrong places. I used to find it. Double slug bug. Anybody see that? Okay, just checking. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail there, but hey, it's a double slug bug. <laughs> That's how my wine works. <laughs> Let's show the world where the true Savior, salvation, saving grace is. It's not in ourselves. It's not in a bottle. It's not in a, a substance. It's not even in our work. Some people call it, turn that into their religion, their work. Anybody can be, re, be religious. Do you religiously put the right shoe on first and then the left shoe? Some people do that. That becomes their... They can't do it otherwise. Let's continue. But who are the workers? Who are they? I absolutely love this picture. It was on my screensaver for quite some time. That's how I want the spiritual mirror. I talked about it last week. That's the spiritual mirror I'm hoping that we're seeing. And this is the spiritual mirror I hope my children see themselves in. That they're being, they have the armor on, they're being anointed by Jesus Christ to go out and fight the good fight, to harvest, to be the workers of the field. That's what I hope for when you look into your spiritual mirror. It's you. It's you. We are His workers. We have dedicated ourselves to His ministry and was work. And we serve God by serving others. By serving others. We have put ourselves to death and raised a new creation in Him. In Him. And who are we? We are the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And 27 says, now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. We are the body. We are the confessed, the repentant, and the regenerated. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are a part of His body. And you have a purpose. You have a purpose. We may not know, maybe you're struggling with, what is my purpose? What is my gift? What does He want me to do? Come see me after church. We'll talk about it. Others, it's clear. <laughs> we know exactly where their gifts are. Exactly. But are they using them? It's a totally different, totally different story. In the 1500s, there was a Catholic nun. Her name was Teresa of Avila. She was a Spanish woman. She, uh, during her lifetime, was put down as a... Not put down, as in killed. Clarify that. <laughs> she was harassed for being almost a heretic because she thought outside of the bun. She thought outside of the circle that the... The Catholic Church says, here, this is it. This is what you are. This is what, period. And she says, ah. 
She's a lot like Luther. She wanted to change things. Wanted to open it up because she had compassion on people. Not the church. The people. She wrote a poem, and I absolutely love it. I'm thinking i put this on the wall somewhere. Remember, this was written, I think, in 1550. Christ has no body. Hold on. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the, yours are the eyes through which He looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which He walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which He blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are His body. Christ has no body now on earth, but yours. But yours. Now, somebody, I've met people that would go, but she was Catholic, and you just, you just quoted a God gifted her to, to write that down. That was exactly what I wanted to get out to you today. That exactly what God wanted somebody to hear for the last a lot of years. Why not use it? Just because they think Remember the discussion about Christians? Remember that? I had a cousin-in-law walk out of a Bible study and I've never spoken to him again because I said, you know, you might see a Catholic in heaven. <clears throat> I did where he went. Judge not, lest thou be judged. And anyway, yours are the feet. Yours are the hands. Yours are the eyes. The only thing that she didn't put in here that I like, I would have liked to have her to put in here Yours is the mouth that He's going to use to spread the good news. Amen? Amen? You are the body of Christ. And thank, thank you, Jesus, that this body will never have to hang on one of those. He's already done that for us. He's already done. He sacrificed His body so that this body... We'll be doing what it's doing. Amen? Amen. Let's continue. Now what shall we do? Be you. Be you. Nobody wants to change you into your... Oh, well, you're not supposed to act like that. You need to be... No, no, you be you. The only one that's going to change you is the Holy Spirit. Not me. If I try to change you, if I have tried to change you, I apologize. <laughs> okay, no joke. Men and women get married. Pastors up here. The grooms standing beside him. The bride comes up to the back with her father on her arm. What does when she looks forward at this scene? What does she see and what did she say? I'll alter him. <laughs> Drum roll, please. Thank you. Thank you. But be you, folks. You who He made you to be you. God will use you as you. He used King David and the things that he did. I can't, I can't condemn the man. He did him. Right? Be bold. Be bold. God did not give us a spirit of timidity. He wants you to boldly go out and be you. And use your God-given mouth, your God-given talents for Him. And be beautiful. Be beautiful. Remember last week's sermon. He, the word image in the Greek means portrait. Today we would say picture or JPEG. <laughs> Be you, be bold as you, and be the beautiful person as the image of Christ. Amen? Charles Spurgeon said, 
it is one of the first and last qualifications of a good workman for God that he, I'm going to add to this Mr. Spurgeon, or she, should put their heart into their work. Be you. Show your heart. Be bold. And be that beautiful heart. God's intention is not to burden you. Not at all. He doesn't want to burden you with the work He set before you. Um, we can have fun at it. <laughs> His intention is actually to lead you to a better and more fulfilling life. He knows you will only be truly satisfied. You only will be truly satisfied if you partner with Him. If you partner with Him. You ever consider that? That you could partner with God and the Holy Spirit and Christ and the thousands that have gone on before you? You can partner with them in service. I just love that. You are meant for good works. You are meant to co-labor. You are meant... You're, anytime you feel burdened, simply cast your cares upon God. Simply ask Him for the help. Ask Him to share His heart with you. And you're going to find a scripture, a psalm, even a, a friendly face. Minister. Minister from His power and His anointing and not your own. I know that when I do it in my own, I usually fail or I come short. When I do it in His power, you think I could do what I do in my power? No. Yeah. I don't deserve to be doing what I do. May you find, this is my hope for you today, I hope you find a good life and good works. I hope that it leads you to joy, peace, and purpose. Remember the, remember the fruits of the Spirit. Remember bearing fruit for God in Christ through the Spirit. Amen. Come on up, music team. I want you to live like you are blessed, which you are. You are blessed. Live like it. Does the world see you as a blessed person, or do you walk around like the condemned? I, I honestly, we all do that at times. <laughs> We all walk around like there's chains at our ankles and we're looking at the ground on our way to the gallows. Like, live like you're blessed. Live, live like you're saved. Live like you're saved. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this discussion today. Thank you for allowing me to be your servant. Father, I pray that your words today will touch a heart and they will live like they're blessed. And that they will share what, why they are blessed. That we can all become that beacon, that beacon of light, that beacon of love that you'd want us to be. Father, I ask that you be with those that are out this week I'd like you to be with those that are making decisions this week. May your spirit guide them, strengthen, and love them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.